Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to our webinar on climate change and human migration. I'm Dr. Bayez Ahmed working as a lecturer in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Um, today we'll have four different sessions, two panel discussions, one keynote speaker session and one in conversation with Professor Ilan Kelman. Now I am going to invite Professor Peter Sammons to give the welcome speech. Uh, Professor Peter Sammons is the founding director of our institute and he is also the head of the department. Professor Peter works at the intersection of natural and social sciences his background is on natural hazard risk, disasters, and recovery. He has extensive experience working in the Arctic in border conflict areas, like in the Ladakh conflict zone, and also in other interdisciplinary work. He also was the commissioner on the UCL Lancet Commission on Migration and Health and also now the gender and intersectionality ambassador for the UKRI network group project that is led by the IRDR Center for Gender and Disaster. Professor Peter, now it is over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Bias, for that um, introduction. Um, really pleased uh, uh, to have everybody here. And really pleased to be um, introducing this uh, incredible uh, webinar on climate change and, and human migration. Um, I'm just going to say a few words. I'm going to sh uh, share my screen just for a moment and uh, if I can obviously uh, uh, pick up on, uh, on this. So I uh, hope you can all see my my screen now. Uh, so uh, welcome and welcome to the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Uh, we've got a fantastic program. This one day webinar brings together scientists and policy makers from South Asia, Africa, Latin America and the Pacific Islands to explore the ongoing debates on the pattern of human mobility in the face of anthropogenic climate change. So it's a really interesting program with some um, outstanding uh, speakers and distinguished guests. Starting uh, straight after this talk, the first panel, uh, which is going to be moderated by Professor Salim Mul Hook on uh, disaster displacement and climate migration in South Asia. So followed by an in conversation piece, uh, Professor Ilan Kelman with more, uh, moderator uh, Christopher Gunnis, a lunch break, and then the keynote speech by the distinguished guest, Dr. Kanto Kumari Rugal from the World Bank, moderated by Bias Ahmed. Then there'll be another panel discussion on climate migration in Latin America and Africa, uh, moderated by Dr. Brian Jones. So a really interesting day of discussions ahead of us. A human-induced climate change is contributing to temperature rise, glacier retreat, sea level rise, and, and uh, extreme climate events. It's disproportionately impacting communities at risk, ecosystems, and livelihoods. In the least developed countries and conflict-affected fragile states are more exposed and less able to cope with the effects of climate change exacerbating existing social vulnerabilities, influencing disasters and affecting how people migrate both internally and internationally. But climate change induced displacement is actually a highly debated topic. Some assume that climate change will create the world's biggest refugee crisis, while others debate this statement on legal, moral and empirical grounds. Climate change migrants are untraceable in most cases the deteriorating economic conditions and health hazards are invisible. This webinar 
intends to shine some light on this. I now just want to say a, a few words about the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Uh, we are uh, 10 years old um, this year. Um, our annual report for 2019-2020 uh, 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 can be found on our, our website. So it features coronavirus uh, uh, on, on the uh, cover, the, sort of the, uh, the uh, impact that has had on, on all of our lives, especially in universities. Uh, but just to look at some of the achievements uh, from the annual report in the last year, uh, relevant, I think, to, to this webinar. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, appointed uh, Dr. Poonam Yadav and De Dr. Jessica Field, both as lecturers in humanitarian studies. We got approval from the UCL Education Committee uh, laundry program, BSc Global Humanitarian Studies, which will start in 2021. We won over £8 million pounds of competitive research funding from UKRI, the Belmont Forum, the Royal Society and the British Academy, and a significant amount of this direct, uh, is directed towards climate-related research. But of course, we are also responding to the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, we set up the IRDR COVID-19 laboratory, we introduced the My Lockdown Journal, and we had European-wide perception surveys on COVID-19. So we've been highly active in the crisis as well. The IRDR has global reach. We look at our uh, uh, Arctic risks, uh, obviously related to, to climate change, uh, and we look at uh, climate change on Mauritius. Uh, we look at landsliding water risks in Bangladesh. We look at uh, health um, um, engagement, particularly over like Zika in Brazil. So we genuinely uh, work globally around, around the world. So it's been our 10th anniversary and just wanted to show a few slides, uh, sort of picking out some features of those 10 years. I mean, we launched with the uh, Eyla Flatia uh, volcanic eruption in Iceland, which uh, halted air travel over most of uh, Northwestern Europe for a considerable time. Oh, next, uh, we were involved in the uh, uh, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and the subsequent uh, uh, disaster of the Fukushima nuclear plant. And uh, actually the, um, the IRDR team uh, was part of a, a British team, which was the first uh, uh, international visitors allowed into the Fukushima site. So we worked on a, a Arctic climate change, and just obviously an image, just indicative of how much the Arctic is, is changing. I mean, uh, just say there's a picture taken of the Barents Sea. Usually you wouldn't be able to navigate through the Barents Sea at this time of year, this picture was taken, just sort of an indication of how much the sea ice is still in there. We introduced teaching in, in space weather uh, into our uh, uh, MSc programs. Um, we've started to get quite a lot of recognition. So Mark Walcott, the uh, UK Chief Scientific Advisor, presented at our IRDR annual conference on the UK National Risk Re Register, which you can probably see just right at the top of the National Risk Register, is of course a uh, pandemic influenza as a risk. We worked on the uh, nearer to home, the tragedy of the Glenfor Grenfell Tower uh, fire and disaster um, in Kensington. And we've been very engaged um, in the uh, Rohingya exodus uh, from, from many points of view, uh, working in uh, uh, refugee camps in Bangladesh, and, uh, Malaysia and India, understanding journeys of, 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 of uh, violence and, uh, and recovery, but also looking at things like cyclone impact, uh, uh, landslide early warning systems and, and other matters. And finally, so just want to introduce our new BSc program, BSc Global Humanitarian Studies. It's a three-year undergraduate degree program. We are recruiting now, um, and it will start in September 2021. This BSc program aims to educate and train future generations of humanitarian leaders in the theory and practice of humanitarian action. This distinctive multidisciplinary program will enable students to gain an understanding of the emergence, impacts and response to humanitarian crises. The critical and analytical skills acquired 
grounded in practice will equip students to anticipate and manage evolving humanitarian threats. If you're interested in this, want to find out more, you can obviously visit the um, IRDR uh, webpage. The undergraduate admissions tutor is Dr. I Bias Ahmed, who you can contact uh, at the humanitarian-info email address. And with that, I will thank you uh, all, and I wish you a really enjoyable and interesting uh, webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Peter Sammons. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm hosting today's webinar. And if you want to, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat box. And if you have any specific questions for our speakers, or the moderators, you can type in the Q&A section. Now I'm going to invite Professor Salimul Haq to moderate our first panel discussion on disaster displacement and climate migration in South Asia. Before that, I want to quickly introduce Professor Hawk. He is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at Independent University in Bangladesh. He is also a senior fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED in London. Uh, to my knowledge, he has attended all the UN climate change conference that's known as COP. And you know, next year, the COP26 will be held in Glasgow in the UK. So yes, very knowledgeable in the field of climate change adaptation, climate migration, and climate justice. Um, he was also he was the he always contribute in the IPCC uh, different assessment reports, uh, and also he was named as the world's hundred most influential people in climate policy for 2020 with vast experience in the field. And I welcome Professor Hawk to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bias. And let me first of all, thank uh, University College London and IRDR for organizing this excellent uh, day long webinar and inviting me to moderate the first session. Uh, so for uh, without further ado, what I will do is I will uh, share the uh, panelists names. We have four very distinguished experts who will give uh, 10 minute presentations each first. Uh, then we hope we shall have enough time for some interactive discussion. And if any of the uh, audience participants wish to ask questions, then please do so in the question answer box as uh, Bias has just uh, uh, given uh, advice on. Uh, the four speakers, and I will very briefly uh, introduce their name and designation and let them give you the longer version of their own uh, experience. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Bina Desai, who is with the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center in Geneva, IMD, IDMC. Uh, the second will be Professor Tasneem Siddiq, who is with the Refugee and Migratory Movements Research Unit, RAMRU, we call it in Dhaka, at Dhaka University in Bangladesh. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Azreen Karim, who's a research fellow at the Bangladesh Institute for Development Studies. And the fourth and final speaker is uh, Dr. Bishajit Mallik, who is the chair of the Environment Development and Risk Management uh, uh, Program at the Technical University in Dresden, Germany. Um, each of the speakers have prepared a presentation. I've asked them to keep their presentation to 10 minutes if they can. I'll give a one minute warning at the end. Uh, and hopefully uh, after all four presentations are done, we will have ample time for some interactive discussion as well. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Bina Desai uh, from IDMC to give her presentation. Dr. Desai. Thank you very much. I'm starting to share my screen and hope it works. Yes, go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you, Salim, and thanks so much, Ahmed and the IRDR 
for inviting me to just set the scene a bit. Ahmed asked me to just give a few numbers, raise a few issues, and then we'll have more in-depth uh, discussions and presentations from the other panelists. At IDMC, we've been since 1998 in the business of monitoring internal displacements of so forced movements within countries' borders, starting with conflict and around uh, a little bit more than 30 countries. Um, steadily adding to that, and then since 2008, also systematically monitoring disaster displacement worldwide. And really since then, we've been able to show that this is a truly global phenomenon. And every year in our global report, we present uh, the total number of new displacements. So this is instances where people were forced to flee uh, and, and to move in the context of disasters, be it through preemptive evacuation uh, or, or spontaneous evacuation but also very often through a longer term um, displacement. And we'll come to that in, in, a, in a short while. And every year we see that the vast majority really of new displacements is in the context of disasters versus the orange that you can see on the left, which is in the context of conflict. And of that uh, almost 25 million, for example, that we recorded last year in 2019, the vast majority again is weather related um, and can be affected therefore by climate change impacts. And every year also in our reporting, we see that the highest numbers occur in Asia and a large concentration is also in South Asia. So the region that we're discussing in this session today. Sadly, in 2019, we had a massive displacement in India as well as in Bangladesh, but also other parts of Asia. India and Bangladesh, of course, also in the context of Cyclone Fani, but in addition to these big events also, large numbers of movements and, and forced displacement due to just seasonal uh, events and, and monsoon, et cetera. And not just, we're not just uh, monitoring displacement as it occurs on a daily basis, but also try to understand risk. So when we developed our global risk model, we weren't surprised sadly, but it was quite impressive to see how much the globe was skewed in terms of the concentration of risk. So disaster displacement is really, and this is mainly around, again, weather related sudden onset displacement is mainly concentrated in Asia. And you can see also South Asia in particular here. And it's a reflection, not just of the high levels of hazard, but also of the high levels of exposure of populations to those hazards and of vulnerability. And a reflection of the fact that where exposure is going down, uh, through uh, mitigation measures, often vulnerability uh, is increasing in parallel and therefore risk is not going down. And for the first time this year, we've been able to not just track and monitor and then report on the movements of people and new displacements, new instances of flight, but also get a first very conservative estimate of the number of people who live in displacement still at the end of the year. And this is a combination of people who've been displaced in earlier years, as well as uh, during 2019. Now, I say this is a highly conservative number because uh, we are able to do this based on proxies only, and we're not able to do this really because we have the exact numbers in place. And this is something that we've been, we are being uh, working on uh, a lot with the countries to try and see how we can get better monitoring of uh, what happens to people after they've been displaced in the first instance, and this for a number of reasons. So why is it important to understand where people are even after the event? It's important, of course, for the fact to, to understand the impacts of displacement and to understand you know, how those can best be addressed and how people can be supported. Uh, the multidimensional impacts across all the different uh, dimensions uh, of life and, and, and of, of well-being. Uh, both for those displaced as well as for the hosts um, and the types of impacts that might be felt very differently by different groups of people. So this is just an example of uh, schooling uh, before and after displacement for um, displaced boys and girls. And you see that schooling after and in areas of and in host areas uh, was improved for boys, but uh, much worsened uh, for girls. But it's also important to understand uh, what happens after initial displacement, after people flee, for, for in order to, let's say, bust a few myths. Um, we've been in the business of monitoring disaster displacement, trying to model risk, trying to look at potential climate impacts for more than two decades, and we're really troubled by the type of uh, narrative that is being spun around climate risks and displacement. 
Um, and there are three myths in particular that really bother us at IDMC. And I, and I was happy to see the framing here of the conference today, of the webinar, to really already start going in that direction. One is, as I said, we can see here disaster displacement is not necessarily short, short term. It doesn't mean that people, when they have to flee in the context of a flood, can return as soon as the flood resides. Very often infrastructure is damaged, housing is destroyed, it takes a long time uh, for people to, to rebuild their lives and sometimes communities cannot go back altogether. So there is protracted displacement. But secondly, that protracted, dis protracted displacement very often actually, in a sense, remains within the countries and regions where those disasters have happened and where the climate impacts are felt. So this notion of mass climate migration to high income countries, to Europe, is something that the evidence does not actually currently support. And it is something that we feel results in troubling or in worrying policies because there is a focus on deterrence, border closures, etc., rather than actually understanding how displacement risk uh, comes about what it's made of, which is a lot about vulnerability, which can be addressed. And then lastly, that disasters are, and, and in a sense, the impacts of climate change are not natural. And it's something that the whole community that you're part of has been discussing uh, for a long time, but it, it does actually, again, have really troublesome policy implications because the overwhelming focus is still on response, on assistance, and not on disaster risk reduction, not on climate change and resilience building, even in the context of displacement. So I'll stop here. I don't think I've used my whole 10 minutes because I really look forward to the conversation and to the discussion. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bina. You, you were very, very good with your timing. Thank you. Um, so let me now move on and, and uh, uh, invite our second speaker, Dr. Tasneem uh, Siddiq from Ramru Dhaka University. Uh, Tasneem, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my presentation is on climate change, migration and displacement and locating the most vulnerable. So you understand that I'll be looking into different groups uh, who, could, who are affected, particularly through disaster and their, how it varies, their uh, impact varies. Uh, these are all data that all of you have, so I won't go through the, this. I'll just quickly say what will be the aim of my presentation. It is, I would like to understand the nature and extent of climate and disaster related displacement in the context of Bangladesh and identify the most vulnerable to displaced displacement. So methodology, if I like here, uh, it concentrate on displacement experience of gathered under three researches. One is Ramru SCMR research, 2013 and 14 on climate change related migration. Second one is a you know, multi five country study, DECMA, uh, from 2017 till 2000, uh, 2014 till 2019, five year research that Ramru was involved in. And the other is Ramru Exeter survey on safe and sustainable cities inclusive to new migrants. Uh, I'll just quickly take you through, only two pictures are from website, but all others are taken by our research assistants. These are when they went to interview people in the rural areas. My basic conceptual understanding is that earlier, we have seen that uh, our uh, previous presenter, Bina Deshai, also said that earlier studies perceived environment and climate change as sole determinant variable driving household migration from ecologically vulnerable areas and then west and other places will be the place where they go. But a uh, lot of studies have been undertaken globally as well as in Bangladesh, which shows that uh, migration is a complex multi-causal phenomenon. It cannot be explained only by climate change or disaster. It, it is combination of many things. And uh, uh, I would also like to say that climate change does not displace people directly. It exacerbates various forms of vulnerability, which contributes to displacement. 
So this is very tricky and complex and interesting. But then again, those who think climate change doesn't affect migration, that uh, you know, you can counter that argument by this uh, framework. Uh, anthropologic climate change affects most of the community, yet socioeconomic inequality make the marginalized group more vulnerable to it. I think that's the basic uh, understanding where my uh, presentation is based on. In Bangladeshi context also, you have all the data. I won't go into those. I, you know, most of the data usually are from IDFC. But then few researches that has been taken place in 2012-13, one by CDMP1, that shows that in 14 climate-affected districts, 12% of the people were permanently displaced, then 46% experienced temporary displacement, which we do see in extreme uh, climate events and uh, people displacing. Uh, and then 29% swung between temporary and permanent displacement, and only 13% never experienced any kind of displacement. After that, if I just take you through the DECMA research finding, not on the whole of uh, four, five or four countries of, of Africa, India, Bangladesh, and others, but then I'll just take you through the Bangladesh picture, and you would see that the uh, using serpentile method when we uh, studied 50 climate hotspots, and then what 8,713 household, each household, 200 household we surveyed, uh, listed and there 34 percent are migrant households and this out of this 34 percent 68 percent were internal migrants and 32 percent were short-term contract migrants to different countries you cannot directly link that these are all climate induced migrant migrants but these are from climate hotspots and these are one of the six reasons they have identified climate change as one of the six reasons uh, disaster and cl climate related events. Now, uh, causes of displacement, I will just quickly take you through that it will differ based on like coast geographic locations. So uh, coastal region or mainland region or northwestern region will have different type of uh, impacts and causes of, uh, you know, that would create migration. Now, Vulnerable groups, if you think in origin areas, again, vulnerability, if you see that it, it would, our research has found that these vulnerabilities are different on the basis of gender, ethnicity, race, and then as well, geographic location. And particularly like homestead loss, agriculture loss, land loss, experience by both rich and poor, but then again, there will be some issues which the poor would harm more compared to the rich people. So if homestead loss, if you think, and will be women, more and more women would talk about homestead loss and uh, you know vegetable patch loss, whereas the uh, men we interviewed, they talked about loss of arable land. Again, women across economic classes identify access to re relief, creating portable, uh, carrying water. These are the problem, but for men, lack of access to loan as major challenge for their uh, uh, rehabilitation process. Now, uh, it, this is in the rural areas I highlighted a little because we have also done research on uh, destination areas. When you come to destination areas, again, vulnerability varies on the basis of their gender, age, ethnicity. Now, low income migrant concentrated, uh, uh, you know, staying in impoverished slum, low lying areas, and the hill slopes of Chattogram. This research was done on Chittagong city, uh, mega city of Bangladesh. And if you say, um, you know, they all, uh, type of environmental hazards or uh, disaster they face, their outcome is different. So top concerns, if I want to identify, women, lack of privacy while bathing, long queue for using toilet, sexual harassment, lack of childcare. Lack of childcare, harmed by more than 
90% those who are working. But men would concentrate on in the urban location, precarious work condition, lack of tenure of job, fluctuating income, police harassment as their main thing. But then again, we interviewed children as well. That's where you see getting wet while commuting to school due to water logging, absence of playground, or, you know, and uh, power cut during study. These are the issues highlighted by the young children. Irregular migration is something we, you know, one has to locate when it comes to um, displacement. Uh, when, you know, in 2014, the worst case of human trafficking of Rohingyas and Bangladeshis, 66% of the Bangladeshis were originated from 19 climate change affected districts. So like hill slopes, those who are living here, their vulnerability as I have said, different. And then these group of people like water, these are all taken by, these pictures are taken by them, the migrant themselves. We gave them cameras and asked them to show us what is their problem. So this is where they are sleeping and then water logging and then eviction, continuous eviction, uh, gas, and then you know what uh, sub electric supply car space for a work, you know for playing these are the issues now policy and laws we all know but i would just conclude by saying displacement displaced population are not homogeneous socioeconomic and environmental risks vary according to gender geographic location type of employment and uh, voice of all groups has to be incorporated in the policies. Now, current practice of concentration of climate adaptation programs only at local level has to be dis uh, ex uh, you know, expanded to accommodate those who migrate to urban cities. The current trend of mega city development has to be replaced by decentralization of urban growth center. Therefore, migration, internal migration will not be seen as a problem. And all these documents, which uh, national documents, which does not reflect uh, climate change, migration, adaptation, I think that has to be incorporated. And Bangladesh has recently, uh, you know, in the process of uh, adopting the national strategy of displacement of urban, uh, you know, uh, that that is something which is like, a, I would say, a right-based document, which is a good step towards tackling displacement through durable solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tasneem, for that excellent presentation and also for doing it exactly on time. Uh, I'm now going to invite our third uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Azreen Karim from Bangladesh Institute for Development Studies to give her presentation. Azreen, please go ahead. Is screen share? Or... Oh, that has to can go. I start? Huh? Stop yes, the uh, same. If you can take yes. yours off, yeah. I did. Sorry. Okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everybody who kind of. Uh, is actually a participant or a kind of participating uh, in this uh, very interesting webinar uh, organized by uh, United, uh, University, University College London. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, UCL and IRDR, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Bayez Ahmed and uh, his entire team for inviting me in this, uh, uh, in this webinar on uh, climate change and human migration. Uh, so uh, I'm actually, doc uh, my name is Dr. Azreen Karim. Uh, I'm from, I'm currently working as a research fellow at the Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, my area of research is uh, basically a disaster risk and uh, economic development. I'm an economic uh, economist by profession and uh, to start with my presentation today, uh, basically I, I, I didn't, I don't have a, a slide share, but I'll focus on my discussion and the points that I, I tried to pitch. I, I'll try to pitch uh, for uh, 
today's uh, intervention. So my focus on today's presentation, it would be uh, climate change, uh, vulnerability and migration, uh, specifically focusing on issues on socioeconomic context and a few evidences uh, focusing on uh, the works, uh, the projects uh, and the studies that I, I'm actually involved with and are currently under publication. So uh, to start with, uh, as we all know, uh, by definition, uh, human migration is by definition actually refers to the movement of people uh, for various reasons. Uh, however, we do understand that in the context of climate change, uh, there, these are often termed uh, not as migration, but rather more of displacement due to climate induced uh, disaster events. Therefore, I actually refer uh, to uh, the climate migrants as climate induced disaster migrants as it actually differs from voluntary migration. Uh, to show the nexus between uh, climate change, vulnerability and migration, uh, we actually we can point to the fact that despite the fact uh, of increased threat of a changing nature of the climatic environment uh, with significant implications on various aspects of development and the human nature of migration. However, the nexus between climate change and migration is rarely understood. Uh, in a situation where we try to actually functionalize this climate risk in carpeting migration, in, most, in many cases, we actually identify the risk as a function of hazard exposure and vulnerability. And uh, we try to put the concept of vulnerability uh, inside the nexus between climate change and migration, which uh, actually helps us to understand how it actually relates to the uh, mainstream development area and how can actually we potentially create uh, interventions to de decrease the impact of climate change on the displaced people. Uh, I'll try to shed some light on uh, focusing on two of my studies and based upon the fact on the current literature and uh, the uh, strategies that we normally think we can adopt uh, focusing on migration. So there are two interesting literatures related to migration if you focus on different studies uh, conducted around the world, including the World Bank and others. Uh, for example, one group of uh, literature actually tried to give the policy suggestion that migration should be taken as an adaptation strategy. But recent evidences are also coming out that it might not be as an effective uh, adaptation strategy focusing on recovery pattern. So as an economist, uh, in a study where uh, I was actually one of the researcher, which we have done at the IDS uh, based on, um, I mean, titled Adapting to Climate Change and focusing on the vulnerability aspects in the Bengal Delta. It actually studied the uh, longer term recovery pattern of the migrants of Cyclone Isla. And very interestingly, we found out that uh, the after 10 years, uh, the non-migrants, the uh, average income level on the agricultural income and expenditure of the non-migrants seem to be better off compared to the uh, migra migrants uh, uh, due to the affected, um, um, I mean, due to the impact of Cyclone Isla. So this is a very interesting uh, result that I think uh, should be pointed out in the context of climate change, because I believe that because climate change is a longer term phenomena, uh, we need to actually focus and monitor the longer term impacts on the climate migrants as well, especially based upon the development dimensions, for example, income expenditure or savings patterns or assets or labor market outcomes as well, and see actually whether migration is an effective adaptation strategy uh, with respect to other development, dim uh, development dimensions, because this is pretty 
tricky in a sense that if you actually follow these people over a longer term, because migration, climate change is a process which is still unfolding, uh, it is perhaps very important to see the recovery pattern of both the groups based upon the economic nature of, uh, of uh, this situation. So this is a one interesting aspect that I wanted to uh, highlight. Another one is, uh, based upon the preparedness behavior. You see in many literatures, uh, we, try, we are arguing, uh, our experts are also arguing that preparedness needs to be there upfront because climate change something is very important. I mean, very, is very much practical, is a reality uh, and it will unfold. Uh, in the coming decade. So preparedness, we need to prepare ourselves. Otherwise we might face the same situation as of the pandemic as we're facing right at the moment. So in a study, in a very recent study where uh, I, were, um, I, I, am, I was actually the study director in, uh, which is titled the, uh, the determinants of uh, household disaster preparedness behavior in Bangladesh. Uh, I found out that uh, the the, there is a significant relationship uh, between disaster displacement and disaster preparedness behavior of the households uh, because displaced people are found to be better prepared due to their past disaster experience and uh, uh, actually respond to government interventions and policies quite effectively, which makes it actually important to uh, integrate uh, local migration policies into the in the development intervention policies as well. So those are the two particular aspects that I thought probably very much important when we are trying to focus on uh, the policy pattern on how it will evolve, sure should evolve uh, in our policy papers. Uh, but we know that strategy paper, especially say the BCC SAP, uh, the strategy paper are basically designed as dynamic uh, documents. So obviously it can be updated and we need to incorporate and we need to focus this changing pattern, the nature as well. One is the longer term, uh, economic recovery and disaster preparedness. So by this, pro uh, I want to uh, stop and uh, probably I want, I'll come back uh, after uh, the other uh, speakers. And thank you Great. very much. Great, thank you very much, Azreen. Extremely interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would in uh, encourage all our speakers to keep an eye on the, the Q&A uh, section uh, there are questions coming in for each of you, which I will invite you to respond to after we hear from our last speaker, who is Bishwajit Malik. Bishwajit, please go ahead. So, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I think the platform is ready for me to talk the opposite of migration. So, I am here to talk about the non-migration and to understand these things in context of Bangladesh. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Bayes Ahmed and his team at the IRDR at UCL for organizing this scientific event and uh, uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, panel where I am sharing uh, experiences with this distinguished professors and scholars in this field. I'm really proud to talk about non-migration in Bangladesh. So first of all, I would like to ask a simple question to everybody that do we actually know how many of the victims of any extreme events actually migrate from their own places? As we have seen from the uh, uh, data set from Dr. Bina Desai and also from Professor Siddiqui that a lot of people are moving, but how mass are staying, we can see the puzzles of the data from here. I am showing you some key statistics. Less than 4% are international migrants in this world. That means 96% of the world population are non-migrant. Somehow they are staying at their own countries, although they have different internal migration options. Secondly, if we see Every year, on an average, 160 million people worldwide are affected by natural hazards. And amongst them, only 25 million people are displaced during last uh, eight years. That is a, a statistics I taken from IDMC. That means around 80% of the affected people are staying put. 
so we can term them as an environmental mig non migrants as they are uh, facing a lot of disaster risk a lot of uh, floods a lot of um, cyclones at their livelihood and they they are struggling to live with that the thirdly i want to mention the report of old bank that is uh, uh, last year published that they claims by 2050 there will be more than 140 million internal climate migrants in three distinct regions that is sub saharan africa south asia and latin america so that means a lot of people also still now staying and on to stay at their own places if we consider now or zoom in this statistics in our country like in bangladesh what we see we see that a recent study that is conducted uh, dr ahmed and will be published soon so for i know so he can he used this uh, population census data of bangladesh of 2011 and he found that 10% of the country population is internal migrants 90% never migrated if we see all the disaster related publication related with population displacement that shows most of them shows that one third of the household send one or two male members to nearby cities or communities for alternative income sources very rarely the whole family moves that means there is a tendency to stay at their own places and they go temporarily to the cities and come back when the situation is better a very recent study that i have conducted i found that 75% of the people living in south coast coastal bangladesh never wanted to migrate despite any conditions of their livelihood so why is this so it is not so state forward to claim that they cannot migrate because they do not have any means to migrate or so called we can trap we can say them trap of course some of them are trapped but not everybody there are a lot of people that deliberately want to stay at their own places so uh, they are voluntary non migrants taking this background into consideration i am bringing you here an examples and try to answer the research questions that i asked myself uh, in 2018 and conduct a field study the research question was that how the livelihood choices at different socio ecological system influence non migration decisions to conduct this study i selected five study villages in southwest coastal bangladesh you can see here the places i selected these places based on their extremity to the cyclone i uh, chose two high risk uh, uh, two villages those who are highly risk to the cyclone two villages those who are moderately risk uh, zone of the cyclones and the on less risk yeah and i conducted 195 household interview including that there are also uh, group discussions seven group discussions and uh, 40, uh, 48 a 38 individual uh, interview so what i have found there if we see the major livelihood are there farming and fishing and in this slide you see that five study villages are categorized into uh, four different socio ecological unit based on their major uh, land use type and livelihood choices they are irrigated agriculture rain fed agriculture mangrove dependent and salt water stream agricultures farming and fishing were the major livelihood choices in the these study villages here you see those the socio ecological unit are closest to the sundarbon are mainly offered the fishing opportunities as their main livelihood choices and those the other are far away from the mangrove uh, uh, sundarbons they have the farming that like the rain fed and irrigated agriculture sustainable system those are also related to their proximity to the cyclones that means places those are less vulnerable to cyclone risk are most farming related and if we just zoom out uh, zoom in to this their migration pattern or future migration aspirations we can see there here i just in the left hand side you can see the statistics of uh, uh, household survey and the right hand side you can see the Uh, results of a group discussions if we see that the mangrove dependent communities have a higher aspiration rate to migrate in futures why first of all we found the regions that better institutional and infrastructural support for their future generation like education 
higher studies or food, healthcare facilities. Most of the people want to leave from these places. But, uh, and also they mentioned that the fewer natural uh, resources are available in Sundar bones compared to the number of users. After all, if we see more than 80% of, of, of my sample people want to stay there. Now I am bringing you to a very in-depth interview that I was talking and I, 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 I used to say the example, it's not an example only for Bangladesh, but I am reading it for you here. Uh, I talked with Rokun Mondol. He is a fisherman living in Gabura, the last settlement of Bangladesh, very close to the Sundarbans. He said that since I was born here, I am living with floods coping with cyclones and fighting with hunger. Where should I go? Migration is not the solution to my family and me. I do not know where I should go. However, I know if I live here, I can go in Sundarbans, catch fishes and sell to the market and can buy food. Not maybe three meals a day, but at least once. And even if I face a problem here, I can get support from my neighbors. However, who will help me in the city? I do not want to go. I think these examples are not only valid for Bangladesh. It is almost everywhere where the, the countries who are facing climate, uh, climate induced risk or climate induced extreme events. Most of the places they have this kind of links. They have a place attachment to stay at their own places. So with this, I want to, uh, come to my last part of my talk and uh, share some takeaway messages. First of all, I can say this finding support the aspiration and capability framework of migration research. As you see here, the desire to stay is dependent on the, not only dependent on the economic conditions, but also on the overall socioeconomic, uh, socioecological context. Basically, the environment conditions play a role. Overall, the variation in uh, socio-ecological system, that is the sustainable livelihood conditions and the corresponding challenges in terms affect the migration decisions, whether they will stay or migrate. And thus, it could be concluded that future adaptation policy planning should emphasize ad aspiration and capacities of the people at risk, so that it is important to diversify the livelihood options of the people who are at a risk, which is not so straightforward, I think. It depends on the nature of the socio-ecological system, the societal conditions, the good governance systems, and therefore I should request uh, the international audience to consider all the aspects of the environment, society, and also the people's aspiration and capa uh, capabilities for future adaptation planning. You may please check with all the references that I have used for my presentation and with this, I would like to thank you all for hearing me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Bishwajit, for that extremely important reminder that migration is not something that everybody can do or does do or wants to do. Uh, it's extremely important to remember those that aren't migrating as well. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our four designated uh, presentations. Um, I'd like to thank all four speakers for excellent presentations and uh, as a moderator for keeping your time uh, within the time limit. Everybody was very, very good. Um, I would also ask you to uh, take a look at the Q&A section because each of you have received a number of uh, questions. I propose to give the floor to each of you in turn in the same order as you spoke um, and ask you to take a couple of minutes, not too much, uh, to respond to one or two of the questions that were made to you in the box. So please look at the Q&A section and I'll start with Bina, who has one question on how do you collect data? How does IDMC collect the data on internally displaced people? And there may be other questions that you might want to respond to as well. So Bina, you have the floor. Thank you, Salim. Um, yes, there's that question and another one that goes with it really nicely, which is how to reduce the data gap, because uh, there's uh, someone who points out quite rightly that a lot of the movements uh, where, and whether people stay or go, that's uh, highly localized, often happens under the radar of official sources, etc. So IDMC 
uses all sources basically that we can get our hands on. So um, in the context of conflict, it's very often UN sources, NGOs, sometimes governments. In the context of uh, disasters, the majority of our main, main uh, you know, starting point uh, is government sources. But the whole point of our work is really using whatever we can uh, find to validate that information that we get to triangulate with other sources and other pieces of information, uh, and then to really uh, undergo a quality assurance, how we call it, process of make, you know, making sense of the information and putting it into context, and then being uh, as confident as possible in the, in the final numbers that we produce. And we have a confidence assessment and a range of confidence for each of the, of the numbers that we put out. Um, in addition to the government or UN, NGO, et cetera, sources, and that comes to the data gap, uh, question. We use a range of, uh, let's say, new technologies, but also different types of partnerships. Um, so that includes partnerships with Facebook and telecommunications companies and trying to just understand location data. That's anonymized data, but really use uh, you know big data in that way. But also we do, in some instances, very detailed satellite imagery analysis, where we don't have access to any information, for example, before or after event uh, data. And we have a partnership with UNOSAT on that. And then we've developed, um, in a sense, an internet scraping tool, you could call it bluntly, uh, I detect, which is, uh, you know, is a machine using machine learning is getting better and better at really pulling out uh, local media uh, news on displacement and also looking now into applying that to social media because often it's harder to find from bigger news items and also in different languages those events but looking at Twitter and other types of um, you know uh, quick uh, where people are quickly uh, reporting on these instances other types of uh, um, uh, technologies that we can milk in a sense to really fill the data gap and we also work where possible with uh, local organizations and NGOs on the ground. I'll keep it there and come hopefully back to some more uh, substantial thank, questions. Thank later. you very much Bina. We, we, I hope we can have another round after this. Uh, so let me now move on to Professor Tasnim Siddiqui. There's a couple of questions for you particularly how do you bridge as an academic the bridge between academia and research and policy making and decision makers. Uh, Tasnim, right. please, right. just uh, if you can uh, be brief yeah. as well. Okay, now first I'll take the other question, which is sure. about, uh, which is about like, uh, why do we researchers always say that there are many reasons, uh, why can't we pinpoint that this much is from due to climate change. I think it is uh, difficult if you are from, uh, you know, the lens of uh, migration researchers, it is always there will be five and six reason and combination of those will produce migration. And uh, that's why it's difficult. But then the research we did for DECMA, that is, uh, you know, the common uh, format, common questionnaire, common survey in different parts of the world, that's where one thing came out in the Bangladeshi context, particularly that 10% uh, people over the last, last five years, they moved 10%. And those 10%, 6% in me, it means, uh, 60% uh, of that 10% move for climate, disaster, and that type of reason. And the rest is death, child, birth, marriage, and other thing counted for that. So we have a figure that says that over the last five years, move move because of certain uh, events which are related to climate, environment, and disaster. Now, another thing is, again, the other question was, why didn't you move? Like, or uh, why, you know, uh, do you want to move? In that question, again, another 5% say they wanted to move, but they don't have the social network, they don't have the place where to go and everything, so they didn't move. So in a way, some of them are trapped. So therefore, I would say when we talk about migration, we don't say that everyone will move. We don't say that everyone wants to stay back. It is a personal choice. Like many of you moved from Bangladesh to UK, many of them, many of us have moved from uh, different cities to Dhaka. So they are also people, there are also climate affected people. Some will move, some will not move. Our main intention is those who want to move, they better, uh, they deserve a better condition in the urban locations or wherever they are moving. That is the main issue. It's not about that push everyone to migrate. Migrate is the only, migration is the only solution. Yeah, and the other question uh, that you say, 
how to jump between academia, research, and policy. It's like, um, it's a, I would say it's a, a personal capacity, passion. Like I personally always, it's a research, from research, try to, you know, organize people to bring policy changes and start advocacy. And then many of the policies we have changed through research and advocacy and practically the policy changes came. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tasneem. And you are one of, one of our best uh, academic advocates in Bangladesh. Uh, well done. Uh, let me now move to uh, Dr. Azreen Karim. Azreen, would you like to answer some of the questions? Uh, there's some specific to you, but you feel free to answer the ones you want. So, you have uh, to turn your mic on. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. You, you're still muted. You need to unmute. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, are you yeah. hearing me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Okay, cool. Okay, sure. Thank you. So uh, one of my one of the question uh, kind of uh, pointed out that uh, it's perhaps no surprise uh, that uh, after ten years uh, the non migrants might. Uh, I mean, seem to better uh, seem to be better off uh, compared to the migrants uh, because of the reason that probably uh, the they have got more resilience power. Uh, the my the affected people who kind of migrated maybe they are less resilient. Therefore, uh, probably. Uh, their recovery is less compared to the non-migrants. So in this perspective, uh, I, kind, I want to point out that the research that we have done, what we have found out is actually uh, that uh, in addition, because the non-migrants seem to actually adopt other coping uh, measures uh, better uh, compared to the migrants who have actually migrated. So there is probably a, a bit of conflict in there saying that well, we can probably argue that whether migration seems to be an effective adaptation strategy or not, or whether other coping measures uh, might be better. So in this perspective, uh, probably policy wise, what we can see, uh, it might be a conflict uh, compared to the uh, ongoing uh, suggestion or the policy suggestion of the government uh, towards migration uh, compared to the other uh, perspective uh, of this argument saying that people's voice might have might be more important who are left behind. So th this is the perspective that uh, I wanted to point out in terms of the longer term recovery. And I'm again and again saying that because we know uh, climate change is a longer term phenomenon in also one of my other paper uh, published in World Development, I argued it is perhaps more important uh, to see the longer term impacts, uh, the development impacts, the recovery patterns uh, of, uh, of uh, in the regional aspect, in the uh, local aspect, to see that what kind of conflict we have got uh, in the different uh, policies that we are adopting uh, for climate change induced migrants. So. Uh, we might have to, there might be some uh, really, really, we need to redesign or, or kind of uh, might have might have to something change uh, the, uh, or frame the localized intervention for the migration policies in, 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 with integration with the other development policies as well. So that is the area I wanted to point out. And uh, one of the other question uh, kind of targeted to me is actually asking that whether migration is uh, adaptation or not. So uh, probably I'm, I didn't say that. I kind of pointed out to two streams of literature because one stream argues that migration is an uh, adaptation can be an adaptation strategy. Others, others uh, stream of literature also try to find out uh, some other argument whether it's effective or not. So there are actually conflict based upon different type of uh, disaster affected uh, area or people, and uh, probably we need more evidence. So particularly the two points that I wanted uh, to uh, point out off and on is it's probably important, more important to see the longer term economic recovery and compare uh, both the impacts on both the migrants and the non-migrants. Probably that is the best approach because this is a longer term phenomenon and we need, we need to actually follow up. And preparedness is absolutely important. We also realized that during the pandemic and uh, without uh, pre preparedness measures, we might have to face the same situation as of uh, uh, the pandemic in the context of climate change. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Azreen. Very well done. Uh, so now I'll invite our uh, fourth uh, panelist to respond to some of the questions 
Vishwajit, if you want to take some of the questions, and then I think we have enough time for another round after this. Thank Vishwajit. you, sirs. Yeah, I think a lot of questions to me, I have found that. Don't take too long. Pick one or two. Yeah, so I, I, I just uh, answering uh, two questions at this moment. So I think the first question was relating with the uh, staying at their own places is related to the cognitive behavior of the psycho uh, psychological uh, matter. I think there are a lot of studies now going on about the cognitive behavior and non-migration studies. I myself also uh, have a manuscript in under review. So this is important that people has an uh, important co uh, attachment to their places and it depends on their uh, perceptions, how they perceive the new places. So play, being in the own places is always a matter of uh, making a decision. So it has an, of course, an influence on their future migration decisions. And then um, uh, the second question is that whether voluntary non-migration can be replaced as an adaptation opportunity. I think it's already an adaptation of, uh, uh, a strategy for the people who are staying there. They are staying there because they know how to adapt with the situation. So. It is already is uh, adaptation strategy. There is no question on that. And then the question uh, asked about the terminology, I think non-migration and immobility. So I would like to say mobility and immobility is just like characteristics of a system or you can say a person or an individual, but migration and non-migration is the process to address that system. So I am not talking about uh, uh, both term is illogical, both term are logical because Non-migration describe the process why people are being immobile. So then you can include all the systems and also the process how it taken care. And then another question that whether in our country the government has any scheme uh, to address this uh, non-migrant people. Actually, I think the government of Bangladesh is doing great for these people how to uh, challenge the climate adaptation strategies or climate risk of the people Government has now uh, Delta 2100 uh, plan. And also I think um, Professor Salim al uh, describes most of the time that we are now trying to develop pairing cities concept. That means the climate resilient friendly cities. So the people who are from Borishal maybe uh, go to Khulna, not just going to Dhaka. So there are a lot of uh, activities now in um, going on in Bangladesh to support migrants and also the non-migrants. And uh, finally, the question related to the gender and generational difference to the place attachment. I think this is a very, very good question uh, to, for the future study on the non-migration. Still now, I didn't consider that, but um, in future, I have a plan to consider the um, intergenerational traumatic behavior due to cyclones or other floods, how it influenced the future migration or uh, future non-migration strategies. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Bishwajit, and thank you to all four uh, uh, speakers for some excellent uh, feedback. So um, what I propose to do now is I will go back to each of you again uh, for a minute or two to think about the future. So we've had a very nice uh, discussion here. Um, we've heard from each other. Uh, I will invite each of you to spend a minute or two just sharing next steps, thoughts, on what you are planning to do, what you think we might do, uh, opportunities for collaboration going forward. Uh, but before I give you the floor, I, and I'll start with Bina, I, I'm going to take my few minutes of, of time to share some thoughts. Uh, and I want to share three thoughts. The first one is the dichotomy between quantity and quality. Uh, a lot of the discussion on migration uh, focuses a lot on numbers. How many are they going to be? Are they climate migrants? Where are they going? Where are they coming from? How many millions? Tell us how many millions. Uh, a huge emphasis on numbers, numbers, numbers. Uh, I'm not against numbers, but I think, you know, we also need to think about uh, people, human beings. And uh, Bishwajit uh, gave us some very good examples of people he went and spent time with in the coastal area of Bangladesh, listening to them, learning about them, uh, finding out what their thinking is and what their options are, stay or not stay, go or not go, go where, uh, all of these are extremely important areas of further research. So a, a, if you like a plea 
for trying to bridge the gap between quantification and quality of uh, human experiences, if we can, as, as researchers in this field. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that in the discussion on whether migrants are climate change migrants or not, a lot of discussion goes on and there's a lot of uh, 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 controversy about uh, claiming who is or who isn't a climate migrant. And until now, I used to say that it is very difficult to attribute, uh, as Tasnim has uh, quite rightly pointed out, who is migrating because of climate change. But the year 2020 is not only the pandemic COVID-19 year, it is also the year where we have transitioned into a climate changed world. Climate has, the temperature has gone up by over a degree and we are seeing impacts of that as we speak. Uh, there's a hurricane Delta hitting the coast of Louisiana that has become a super cyclone, a super hurricane because of climate change. The wildfires in California and Oregon are super wildfires because of climate change and in fact, the number of climate migrants in Oregon are 500,000 people displaced because of climate change wildfires. Okay, so this climate migration now, as of 2020, we have reached a tipping point. All migrants, because of environmental factors, to some extent, we can say they have been made worse because of climate change. And we don't need to say whether it's 5% or 10% or 30%. It is more than zero and therefore, climate is affecting them. Human-induced climate change is affecting the migration patterns of the future as of 2020. So anything that happens after 2020, we can attribute that there is an element of human-induced climate change involved in the environmental factors that, they have, uh, that are causing them to uh, have to be moved and be displaced. And the third and final point, uh, I will uh, reach out to the uh, the discussions that we have on this issue under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which Bias mentioned in his introduction. Uh, as you know, the next conference of parties will be in November 2021. Next year, it was supposed to have been November this year, but it's been postponed because of COVID. It will be next year in Glasgow, Scotland. And we are uh, expecting that this issue, which under climate change migration falls under the topic of loss and damage from climate change. So it goes beyond adaptation. It's when you fail to mitigate and fail to adapt and you have loss and damage and you have forcible displacement. That's when you have a very clear category of climate induced migration taking place. And uh, in the next conference of parties, this will be a big issue where all of us in this uh, conversation, I think can play a role in, in producing knowledge-based products that can inform that decision-making that will take place in uh, just over a year's time in Glasgow. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over uh, for a minute each, if you don't mind, or two minutes each uh, from each of you to reflect on a way ahead. Any, any thoughts on what you think we might be able to do going forward? I'll start with Bina. Thank you very much, Salim. And I'll combine it with responding a little bit to what you were saying, because the attribution question, which was in many of the questions in the in the chat here, is really, I think, is the question is like, if we try to do that, what is the purpose? And yes, under the loss and damage discussion, if we talk about financing and also justice, then there is a purpose. And then you will try to put a number to it. You will try to start the negotiations, the bargaining. From the perspective of the people, it's already happening, as you say. And as we heard from Malik, it's uh, the range of choices is getting smaller and smaller potentially. And that's what we should be worried about rather than you know, really saying, why is the range of choices getting so much smaller at this particular instance versus at that? but rather see how we can broaden the range of choices again. And I think there you're absolutely right with your point of saying we need to go beyond the numbers, which we've seen in our empirical research, local research, people are concerned already about climate change, they're experiencing it. And they're wondering, they're thinking about for those that are displaced, you know, what the options are. And in the displacement community, there's talk about durable solutions, which are returns, resettlement or local integration. And local integration, so integration where people have arrived is mostly the preferred choice. And this is what we need to deal with. We need to be realistic in our policy responses, in our operational responses. We need to advocate vis-a-vis -vis governments uh, and, and those decision makers who can enable local integration. 
that there is no way around it, basically. Thanks. Very good. Uh, can I just ask you, Bina, if it, what are the plans for the IDMC's next round of work? So we are actually, thank you for asking, giving me the floor <laughs> on that, because we are ramping up our work on climate, the understanding and unpacking more the relationship between climate change and internal displacement. Our next global report will have a focus on this, and we look forward to working with several of you, and I've already taken note of those that I will reach out to. We will start also a, a range of discussions on these subjects and really trying to see where we can, from IDMC's point of view, add value, and that is around some of the myth busting I mentioned, but also see where we can come together in a part global partnerships on improving the data and the evidence base, improving our understanding of risk and really what drives displacement risk in these contexts, and combined with our understanding of migration as adaptation and you know this whole notion of choice and then also putting a strong focus on solutions and the solutions for example that you've been discussing in bangladesh about the secondary cities but also other types of solutions for those that for example as dr malik was saying uh, choose to stay and what what uh, how they can be supported thank you thank you very much uh, tasneem uh, some thoughts on yeah. on where do we go next Future. I know you always uh, have lots of thoughts on what to do next. <laughs> no, I think I think uh, Bina has nicely stated. You also state that's why I never give figures because you know it is uh, if you just you know go into this debate that is also like time consuming and unnecessarily we uh, sidetrack the issue and also if we whether climate change is an adaptation tool or not that is also a sort of, um, I would say, doesn't produce the ultimate outcome. What is the outcome? I would say for the time being, if we just say that we want development, sustainable development, and for sustainable development, you know, all the, uh, both rural and urban growth centers, rural area, both where there has to be a balance. When you are, you know, pool factor brings in workers in urban areas, either they are climate induced or not, they deserve better place. That is why when you talk about connectivity, when you talk about you know, their space in urban locations, doesn't mean you are not talking about local level adaptation because local level adaptation, most of the funds are being spent on local level adaptation in most of the countries. And migration is just a new thing now and not a single funding has been allocated to migration to you to be used as a, a, one of the many adaptation tools. So I would say give space to migration along with local level adaptation because uh, Azrin's study has come up that during, you know longer term longitudinal study showed a different types of result. But we also did a longitudinal study where 20 years and 10 years interval that shows those who have done better, who have combined local level adaptation with migration, one or two family members migrating to Middle East, the economic condition of that household is way better than those who locally trying to adapt, of course, from similar economic background. But those who are in a better economic background in the rural areas, they didn't need to migrate in the first place at all. So let us look into the whole thing from a holistic perspective. Don't contradict things with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Tasneem. Let me just add, before I give the floor to Azreen, uh, let me add a little bit on the, um, the Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, which has been referenced already. This was produced uh, more than 10 years ago in 2009. Uh, there is a new version that is now hopefully going to come out very soon. I was one of the contributors to that. And one of the big differences between the new Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, which will take us to 2030, and the old 2009 version is the recognition of uh, climate migration. In 2009, we really did not recognize it. We just, you know, it was mentioned, but there was nothing in there to address it. This time around, it is something that is, has been recognized. And hopefully once we see the final version, uh, it's published by the government, we will see that the issue of how do we deal with the future climate migrants that will take place over the next 10 years? How, do we, how does the government intend to respond to looking after them, caring for them and planning the, uh, the influx that is going to happen? Uh, so uh, something to look forward to 
uh, in the coming months. We hope it will be published soon. Uh, Azreen, would you like to just share some thoughts on where do we go from here? And, and what are your own particular plans? What kind of things are you uh, looking at to, to take forward? Azreen, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim al -Haq. OK. Uh, First of all, uh, I, I want to uh, point out to my one of the study that I already pointed out, but with a different perspective. Uh, the study that I pointed out uh, earlier is the determinants of household disaster preparedness behavior in Bangladesh. In that study, one of my research question was, in the absence of a globally agreed uh, loss and damage framework, uh, can actually a disaster preparedness uh, be a response mechanism? to this loss and damage. So in that particular study using a, a, a big data, like a, a data that had been conducted by the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics on uh, 143,980 households is a very big data and using 12 natural disasters. So wh what we actually found out that knowledge and perception Climate knowledge and perception is very much correlated with disaster preparedness behavior. So this is very interesting finding in a sense that uh, in even in many uh, webinars and workshops that I attend, even pub like high level public officials are saying that public awareness interventions might not be fully effective without climate knowledge and perception. So are we actually delivering that particular knowledge to the people who are really affected? Are they really, uh, do they really understand what is climate change? And uh, that probably will help us the other way around, how to identify these people as well from survey questionnaire, for example, right? So that is uh, one way of doing it. And uh, another side is our disaster and climate change model for over the years seems to be more of supply, using supply side perspective. So for example, cyclone shelter or embankments, we more or less we focus focus on those particular interventions. But in my study, I wanted to show that uh, whether the demand side interventions could be helpful or not in reducing these losses and damages and how demand side perspectives could complement this supply side perspective Perspectives as well to make both of these intervention side fully effective. So that is very important. And the perspective that I actually took, uh, like uh, from the uh, development area, is one is unemployment, one is production. So which channel is more effective in terms of reducing these losses and damage? So these two criteria seems to be very much important in the, probably in the coming years so when we uh, the world is going to formulate uh, a generalized framework for loss and damage. And damage. One is uh, knowledge and perception, probably that will help us to redesign even different type of uh, preparedness education program. For example, the 72 hour early warning, not probably uh, like uh, from the very behind or like three to five day based flood forecasting fact that knowledge and perception is important and demand side intervention is equally important as of the supply side intervention. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you very much, Azreen. Uh, very, very well put. Uh, so our last uh, uh, intervention will come from Bishajit. Some thoughts on, on where do we go from here and what are your own personal uh, uh, research uh, thinking going forward? Uh, if you can be brief, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. So I think uh, I, uh, uh, according to my knowledge or uh, discussion that we have today, so as uh, Professor uh, Taslim Siddiqui, Madam, said that uh, we need not to debate on the who are climate migrants or who are environmental migrants or who are not non-migrants. Non we need to work in, uh, for the betterment of the people who are actually facing this risk. Uh, so that could be the cyclones, that could be the hazards, any, any kind of thing. So need a collaborative work. And that's why I think uh, the uh, leaders or the lobbyists or the policymakers, they should consider the international collaboration as well as internal collaboration, collaborative research and giving funding for that. And I think our government and also the uh, uh, international donors, they are also trying to improve this uh, funding or collaborative research in Bangladesh. There are a lot of uh, research is going on and taking this as an opportunity, I am also planning to apply for an European Union research grant uh, to study in the South, uh, Southeast Asia uh, South Asia and also the East Asia is in Vietnam and also some countries of Africa to study the historical dimensions of people's 
migrations. We are always claiming that climate or economic background, but I think if we know the history of uh, the settlements, that will give us more knowledge to plan for the futures. So what the people actually thinking from the history, so why the people living in Sundarbon, uh, near Sundarbon, why the people living in Rangpur, I think there is a very uh, handful literature on that and it depends on their skills. Uh, uh, people who are living in Sundarbans, they cannot work in Rangpur because they have different skills of their livelihood. I think that that type of things integratedly, uh, a bro broader study will give us more knowledge on that. And that is my plan next five years. I try to uh, fund for that. And if I am successful, hopefully, I can contribute to this field of migrations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mucha. And good luck with your grant application. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, before I hand over uh, back to Bias, uh, uh, let me first thank all our distinguished speakers for some excellent uh, preliminary presentations and then some very, very good discussions. I hope that our uh, interaction will continue beyond uh, this particular webinar. Uh, and I look forward to having uh, further uh, bilateral discussions with each of you uh, going forward. Uh, let me just also share a few thoughts uh, um, with our uh, webinar organizers, the uh, University College London and uh, the IRDR, uh, particularly Professor Peter Sammons and, and uh, uh, Bias. Um, th thank you, first of all, for organizing this session, inviting the speakers and myself. Uh, I hope you got to value for money in terms of uh, the discussion from all of us. Uh, I, I do think a, a little bit that uh, even though you titled this South Asia, we, we sort of monopolized the Bangladeshi end of South Asia uh, amongst the speakers here. But I make no apologies for that. I think Bangladesh is a very interesting part of South Asia and, and the issue of uh, climate migration is very relevant in, in the Bangladesh part of South Asia as well. So what I would suggest uh, and, and offer, if you like, uh, to UCL and IRDR going forward is to continue this uh, collaborative discussion uh, going forward, looking for potential grant applications as we just heard from Bishwajit uh, to do further research, but also let me make an invitation from my side uh, to invite UCL, uh, IRDR and all the other speakers who participated in this panel uh, to join us in our next annual Gobeshana conference. So Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research and, and I'm going to try and get everybody to learn a little bit of Bangla by learning uh, uh, Bangla uh, about Gobeshana. It's a platform of more than 50 universities and research institutes, uh, mostly in Bangladesh, but many outside Bangladesh as well who do work on Bangladesh. And the research is about broadly uh, climate change related, but a across a very broad spectrum, including the issue of climate migration. And we, amongst the many things that we do, which I won't go into, we hold an annual conference every January. Uh, for the last six years, the last one, the sixth conference was held earlier this year in January. It's a physical conference where people come uh, from all over the country and then quite a few from outside the country. We spend four days together. It's hosted at my university, the independent university in Dhaka. But because of the COVID situation, the next year's conference, which will be from the 21st to the 24th of January, 2021, we are taking it online. And in fact, we are going to make this into a global conference from next year onwards and continue to have it as an online conference in the f subsequent years going forward as well. So I would like to invite IDMC as well, uh, as well as uh, UCL uh, to maybe have a, a further offline bilateral conversation on doing a session, uh, re building on this particular session, but taking it forward uh, in terms of what we can do together going forward and having a, uh, a future looking perspective rather than simply analyzing <clears throat> the present uh, and, and see whether we can collaborate in generating new knowledge but not just knowledge for academic publication sake, which I think all of us in this meeting uh, uh, agree is not sufficient. We need to be doing knowledge that is useful both for policymakers and most importantly for 
people themselves. And, and I, I want to end and reiterate that fact that the biggest client for our research, we need to think of, and we need to be better at getting to and explaining to and engaging with people, the most vulnerable people. And obviously the higher tiers of decision-making are important, but in, our, in my view, uh, we should never forget that we, sh we need to be having our client as the most vulnerable people who are being affected by impacts of climate change. And then thinking about how we frame our research, conduct our research that enables them to have more choices, have better options, uh, deal with the problems in a better way than they have been so far. Uh, and I think my time is up. So let me now uh, hand over to uh, uh, Bias to, to uh, conclude the session by thanking all of our participants. Thank you again very much for participating. Bias, please take over. Yes, thank you, Professor Salimul Haq, Professor Tasneem Siddiq, Bina Desai, Dr. Azreen Karim, and Dr. Bishrijit Murlik. It was excellent and excellent <clears throat> session. And really, it was full of academic and scientific discussions and debates. And we came to know a lot about climate migration and its, its impact on local communities, whether they are migrating, displacing, moving or non-migrating. Thank you so much. Yes, I want to ensure one thing. Uh, this, uh, to our participants, of course, this day-long workshop is not all about South Asia and particularly about Bangladesh. Next, we have Professor Ilan Kelman will talk about global perspective and after lunch, we have Dr. Kanta Kumari from the World Bank. That is also, again, from the global perspective. And the evening, we have a specific panel discussion on Latin America, Africa, and the Pacific Islands. Yes, and at the end, we are planning to produce a policy brief with, uh, involving all the speakers and panelists, and of course, the Q&A asked by our participants. It would be all included. And hopefully our policy brief would contribute for the next upcoming IDMC global report. And also we can have a specific session during the COP26 next year. We should start planning for it, how climate migration fits within all these different um, uh, perspectives. And I really want to thank you all the speakers and the moderator from panel discussion one. Now I want to move forward to the next session that is in conversation with Professor Elan Kilman and the moderator would be Christopher Guinness, uh, who is an, Chris is an award winning journalist. He previously served as a spokesperson and the chief spokesperson for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East. He also worked for the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, as a producer, reporter, foreign correspondent, and news anchor for over 25 years. Extensively experienced. Uh, Chris, I would now welcome you to take over for the In Conversation. Thank you very much, Bias. And as you said, I'm in conversation with Elan Kelman, Professor of Disaster and Health here at UCL's Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Elan, welcome to the session. Thank you much, so much. Glad to be here. We cannot see you. Ah, let me try and rectify that. Can you see me now? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. As I was saying, I'm in conversation with Elan Kelman, and today the controversial and hotly disputed issue of climate migrants. Can you define them? Can you say even if they exist? The United Nations seems to think so, and in a landmark ruling in January this year, determined that it is unlawful for governments to return people seeking asylum from countries where the climate threatens their lives. Elan isn't so sure about these categorizations and it's written widely to uncover some of the contradictions and nuances in the debate. Elan, first of all, let's sort out some basic terminology. What exactly is a climate migrant as opposed to a climate refugee? And by the way, is a climate migrant, is climate change, um, is there such a thing as a climate change migrant? 
So this is actually the fundamental question. And we heard a lot of really great discussion this morning on it, but a lot of it then re relates to why people use the terms without really focusing on what they actually mean. So we can start with, uh, for example, refugee. And refugee actually has a specific meaning in international law. So the United Nations, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, had a document in 1951, which they then updated in 1967. This was accepted by the countries who sign up to the convention and the protocol. And the idea is that a refugee is specifically someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, and they've crossed an international border. So legally, and how the world views refugees, they are not linked to climate, they are not linked to climate change, they are not linked to the environment. So even the question of how many climate refugees are there, how many climate change migrants are there, sorry, how many climate change refugees are there, those are both non-starters because the answer is zero. Now definitions can change and that's fine. But at the moment, what the definitions are, the refugee cannot be linked to climate or climate change. Now, the reason also that I keep on saying climate and climate change is because they're different. And people often forget this and actually bring them together. So climate is just average weather. Take temperature, take precipitation, take something that we use to measure weather, average it over a long time period, typically 30 to 50 years, although they've been talking about making it 20, and that's what climate is. Climate change is a change in the climate, which sort of has some logic to it. And so all it means is that weather statistics are changing. So we also have to be very careful about saying, are we talking about climate? What is the climate in our place? And how's that affecting people? Okay. Or are we talking about the changes yep. in those statistics and the changes in the weather? Elan, let me just jump in if I can. Can we talk some specifics? Because there are some known examples, as I understand it. For example, in Alaska, what defines them specifically? And are there any others in this specific group? Right. So now it's exactly that. So we say, OK, fine. So climate is changing. We can't have refugees, but we can have migrants. So who is moving and how far are they moving and why? And is it directly linked to climate change? And at the moment, all the case studies that we've looked at, we actually cannot come up with a direct link between climate change and the decision to migrate, apart from very likely about 14 villages in Alaska. So climate change is actually increasing the air temperature that's reducing the amount of sea ice with less sea ice, you get much more powerful waves attacking the coastline. And that coastline is eroding to the point that trying to defend it or keep it is proving very challenging. So those villages have been looking at moving about 10 or 20 kilometers inland, and that is directly connected to climate change impacts. But, but Ian, let me ask you specifically on Bangladesh, forget Alaska. Are you saying we cannot say that people in Bangladesh who've moved because of rising sea levels are not climate migrants? Well, at the moment, to make that statement is incredibly challenging. We know that climate change is happening. We know that we're causing it. We know that is leading to many impacts, including sea level rise, ocean acidification, and increased intensity of storms. But the Bangladeshi coastline is dynamic and always has been dynamic. So things may change, things will probably change in 20, 30, 40 years. But at the moment, efforts to say this coastline is changing only because of sea level rise for Bangladesh have actually not been successful. I'm sure when we come to the Q&A session, Elan, there will be people who want to pick you up on, on some of this, but let's talk numbers. Um, you've mentioned Alaska, you've mentioned the problems of categorization. How many cases of climate migrants do you believe there are in the world? Well, this is different from climate change migrants. Climate migrants, as the panel this morning brilliantly said, migration is multi-causal, it includes, but is not limited to environmental factors. So absolutely, climate affects migration. There are many people who've migrated partly or almost entirely because of climate. That is not climate change. So for example, people in the UK, you know, I'm sitting here in London, 
How many people in the UK have bought second homes on the French Riviera or Southern Spain? And they disappear during there during the UK winter for good reasons. They are obviously climate <laughs> migrants, but we don't call them that. We call them expatriates. <laughs> we say, oh, well, they're helping the economy. We say that they have built up the retirement fund after working hard, which is perfectly right. And they deserve their winters in the Mediterranean, which is absolutely right. But we don't call them migrants. Okay, they okay. Are climate migrants, but we label them with something else. So let's move away from the French Riviera um, and back to, say, Bangladesh. And I want to pick up on something that Professor Al Haq said. He said that the clients themselves, the main clients, are the affected populations. And I think that's something rather important. Um, how in this discourse do the people themselves feel about being categorized like some kind of subspecies? Do we actually hear their voices enough in this debate? Who represents them? Is it people like us sitting around in academic institutions? Is it their, pol is it their politicians? Is it their local community leaders? How do their voices folk feature in the research that you're writing? And, and this is such a brilliant question because of course I don't represent them. And of course, I'm representing who I am and the fact that I'm a scientist at an institution. So what we do a lot in our work is we simply go out and talk to people and we ask them. And what, what also a lot of scientists find is that if you start with a question, you know, climate change is a big issue. Are you going to migrate because of it? That completely biases the results. And it's very hard to actually believe what people say. And it would be the same with me. If someone asked me that question, immediately I'm thinking along a certain track. What we did is we actually just went in and said, you know, are you thinking of moving? Why or why not? Where would you go and why? And then sort of separately, I'm curious about your environment. Do you think things are changing? And when we did that without presupposing anything about climate change migration, then we actually got very different answers to people who've gone in and said, climate change is affecting you. Are you going to move? So what we absolutely need is some of the wonderful work which the panelists this morning did, which we'll hear more this afternoon, to just sit down with people and talk to them on their own terms. And in, I, I work a lot in islands, and a lot of people in the Pacific Islands actually say, don't call us climate change migrants. Don't call us climate change refugees. How dare you label us? How dare you tell us what we are and why we are moving? We will make the decision. We will do it on our terms and do it with dignity which is absolutely right. And I have no right to try and tell them differently. I have no right to go in and tell them, oh, well, I'm so much better than you, I know more. Instead, we have to listen and recognize that people want control of their own lives and livelihoods. Maybe that includes an element of forced migration and that's fine, but let's work with them on their own terms to ensure that any movement, any migration or any immobility is actually done according to their needs and supporting what works for them. But and be that if scientists are able to do that. Sorry to interrupt you. If I may, there's a real problem here for public advocacy. I mean, we heard in the previous session a sense that the group wants to input into public policy to represent these arguments in the discourse to governments. But if you can't categorize them because they quite rightly feel they have issues about how they're categorized, if you can't count them, how do you make the debate at the level of government, which is surely where you want to start influencing policy. Well, the challenge is that most governments these days, at least the ones that are elected, have their preconceived views on migration already. And so even if we were able to label and count, often that evidence would be bypassed, that evidence wouldn't be used. For me, if I'm talking to policymakers and to the media and to government, my bottom line is that people are actually people. And whether they're migrants, whether they're refugees, whether they're asylum seekers, whether they're people who are trapped and cannot move but want to, they are still people. So what do we want for people? And for me, I would hope that we want them to have fulfilling lives and opportunities to obey rules and regulations and norms and laws, but to have the opportunities, which I have been so privileged in my life to have. So if I go to a government and they say, well, what are you going to do about climate or climate change influencing migrants or refugees? Well, what do we want for a country? Do we want the excitement of diversity? Do we want to treat people as human beings? Do we want to thrive, do more than survive? Do we want to thrive and actually bring in different ideas, different approaches and do so well with regards to everyone's livelihoods? 
Or do we want to simply shut down and say, well, I'm better than you. And why should I even think about letting you in? You know, why not have a point system for immigration? Because then we can decide who's better than other people. And we can actually get the best people from a country and drain them from the country which potentially they could help build up. But, but Elan, if I may, are you saying that it's impossible to make a specific case for a specific category of people on this specific issue, that we should simply give up on the idea of targeted governmental public advocacy? You're talking about climate change migration? Yes. Well, we are trying to count them and we're trying to work out exactly causes for migration. So in Alaska, those are examples of climate change migrants. Absolutely. In the future, there may be more. And one huge impact of climate change, which may very well force people to move, is actually heat. So heat waves are perfectly typical. We can deal with them if we choose to. What climate change is doing is pushing heat waves beyond human survivability. So suddenly you can't get to your crops outdoors and your livestock start dying. You don't have enough fresh water. So as soon as heat waves move into the realm beyond human survivability, then we are into a situation where people have to either move or die. We're not there yet, but all the climate change projections say this is going to be big. This is going to be terrifying. So I actually think that attribution is very important. I think trying to count and recognize why people are forced to move is very important and give it 10, 20, 30 years, large swaths of land are not going to be available for agriculture. People are, go are not going to have their livelihoods. And so yes, they are going to be migrating because of heat and that will be migrants directly attributable to, to, to climate change. If we are not counting them, we're missing the point. You've mentioned projections, and the World Bank has said that by uh, 2050, there will be 143 million. It's not entirely clear to me how that was calculated, but do you believe in those huge, those astronomic figures? Are they plausible in your view? Well, uh, a fundamental aspect of science is that all models are wrong, some are useful. <laughs> what the World Bank did is a wonderful scientific piece involving modeling. But because it's modeling, it's wrong. The question though, is it useful? And absolutely, I mean, that, that report is phenomenal, very well worth reading. And they're actually now working on, on a second one. And it is really cutting edge, important, very vibrant silent science. How useful is it? A lot of the problem is the messaging. And so that number 143 million, is actually the pessimistic estimate at the upper end of the uncertainty interval. <clears throat> so they quite rightly took three scenarios, pessimistic in between and optimistic. They then quite rightly modeled and took uncertainties to have an upper bound and lower bound. And the 143 million is the upper bound of the pessimistic. So why is everyone quoting it when there are so many other really useful numbers within that report? So a lot of it is how do we apply the science? How do we communicate it? And the World Bank's work in that report, we need more of it, it's wonderful. But is it right? Well, it's a model. So it's going to have limitations and we have to be so cautious not to take one figure to represent a huge amount of work and a very long, detailed and highly scientific report. So let me ask you that, I mean, where does the debate go about categorization and about numbers. I mean, when is it, it seems important to resolve it soon because governments do need to start taking action and they need to start taking action on the basis of firm science, on firm categorization, on firm figures. How does that move forward? Because it seems from what you describe as if we're not in a particularly good place right now. Well, there's, <clears throat> there's two levels. Number one is what does the science say? Number two, what can we do for policy? And number one, science is a process. So trying to say on 9th October 2020, we are going to make the decision that these are the numbers and then move on. That's not how science works. Saying that 2020 is a tipping point and now we can identify climate change migrants or climate migrants actually makes no sense. Because we're continually reevaluating, we're continually doing research. So we need to continue working through the assumptions, the uncertainties, the unknowns to say, are the numbers meaningful? Are they useful? How can we do better with our models knowing they're still wrong but useful? This should not stop action. This should not stop policy. We know now what governments should do. 
irrespective of the uncertainties, irrespective of the, the, the continuing science. And governments need to treat people as human beings. Governments and people and media need to stop demonizing migrants, need to stop with the assumption that migration is bad, because that assumption makes no sense, and needs to stop with the assumption that migrants cause problems, because what science shows is that in most cases, migrants help the local economy. And in fact, migrants can be far more damaging to the place they came from than the place that they arrive in. They say leave behind the people who cannot migrate and the people who cannot migrate are generally the ones who are poorest with the fewest options and then end up relying on remittances. So when it comes to migration specifically, we know how to act. When it comes to climate change specifically, <clears throat> no matter what the uncertainties in the models and projections in the futures, we know now what we need to do on climate change. So we need more science, yes, but we don't need more science to do something. Elan, you've talked about the point system. You've talked about the pejorative way in which people regard refugees, the pejorative terms that are used in the discourse around refugees and migrants. Do you understand that by contrast to that, there's a lot of sympathy around the world for issues around the environment, and that perhaps linking, if we can, the notion of migrants and refugees to the notion of climate and climate change, that's going to make the case easier to make. Um, and therefore, in terms of public policy and the public discourse, you can understand why groups such as this might want to, want to make that link. Well, and I think we should do it, but on an evidence basis. So... To, to, so we know that by the definition of, of definition of refugee at the moment, there are no climate or climate change refugees. But we know that there are that climate does and always influences migration. This means that climate change does have some influence. Attribution itself is almost impossible, but that should not stop our concern, nor should it stop us continuing to investigate the links which occur. Also, this means when we look at issues such as heat, and potentially sea level rise, and potentially ocean acidification, when we're looking 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the future, if we do nothing, and the World Bank report is brilliant in this, it says, if we do nothing, it will become a big problem. And there's that conditional if. Well, there's the answer, let's do something now. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole point that if we are going to make the links on a scientific basis, there is plenty there to galvanize action. So we don't have to wait 30 years for the heat waves to occur. If we don't act now, they are going to occur and people are going to die in high numbers. So this is where we can come together and say, maybe on some of the finer points we disagree and there's a lot more research to do, but we know what the concerted action should be. And we know how to move forward together with what we know already, irrespective of the uncertainties. And the whole point is that if people are for some reason terrified about migrants, if people really actually want to ensure that homes remain homes no matter what the climate, the time to act is now. And we know exactly what to do. And it, it simultaneously, it's about stopping people being forced to migrate while supporting those who want to migrate. Those two are entirely compatible and actually there's no contradiction. So this is how we can move forward together, even while we work out the finer parts of the science and the evidence. Now, Ilan, before I open this to the floor, I'd like to bring in Olga Sheskina, a specialist in international law and a professional in the field of disaster risk reduction. She's worked both for national and international organizations, including UN agencies across several regions. Olga, I'd like you to talk us through, please, that important UN ruling which I mentioned in my introduction relating to so-called climate change migrants, which originates in the Pacific territory of Kiribati. Could you explain the ruling and its background, please? Thank you very much for the introduction and for giving me the word. Indeed, um, the ruling of the United Nations Human Rights Committee um, it's a landmark decision with potentially far-reaching implications for the international protection of displaced people in the context of climate change and disaster. The ruling does not mean that the climate refugees... Hello, Olga. Hello, Olga. Ilan, are you there? I am there. We can maybe wait for her to come back if... Okay. Can you, uh, can you see me? Oh, sorry, we lost you momentarily. Please carry on. Thank you. So 
indeed, this um, UN Human Rights Committee made a landmark decision this year with potentially far-reaching implications uh, for the international protection of displaced people in the context of climate change and disaster. It's the first UN uh, decision by UN, UN Human Rights Treaty body on a complaint made by an individual seeking asylum protection from the effects of climate change. Once again, it does not mean that the climate refugees will become an official legal term or the climate change will be incorporated in the Refugee Convention, which qualifies who, um, uh, which outlines who qualifies for the refugee status. But just a few words about the background of the case. Ioana Teitiota, a national of the Republic of Kiribati, requested a refugee status in New Zealand in 2013 claiming that the effects of climate change and sea level rise forced him to migrate with his family from his home island in the Republic of Kiribati to New Zealand. The case was neither the first nor the last of its kind. Both Australian and New Zealand authorities had considered a number of similar cases going back at least as far as 1995. Teotihuacan Te claimed that the situation on the island has become increasingly unstable and precarious due to the sea level rise caused by the global warming. Fresh water has become scarce because of saltwater contamination, overcrowding on the island. Attempts to combat sea level rise have been largely ineffective. Um, inhabited land on the island became, uh, has eroded, resulting in a housing crisis and land disputes that led uh, to numerous fatalities. And therefore, the uh, life on the island became, um, it became a violent environment for the claimant. However, his claim was rejected and his family was deported back to Kiribati uh, in 2015. Uh, the tribunal decided that he could not qualify um, uh, as a refugee under the Refugee Convention. Whatever harm they faced uh, due to the anticipated adverse effects of climate change did not arise by reason of their race, religion, nationality, membership of any particular social group or political opinion. And what's important of, on that case is that the reasoning of this case um, in the tribunal in New Zealand also led to abandonment of refugee claims in similar cases, for instance, in the case of citizens in Tuvalu in 2014. After authorities denied Tetiota's claim of asylum and deported him back as a claim of asylum as a climate refugee and deported him back to um, Kiribati, yeah, he he brought a case against the government of New Zealand at the UN Human Rights Committee. Just for those who don't know that, it's um, uh, basically the UN, United Nations Human Rights Committee monitors uh, states parties' adherence to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which today has 172 uh, state parties. It's made of 18 uh, members who are independent human rights experts. And there is an optional protocol that has 100, uh, 116 state parties, uh, which establishes the right of individuals to complain to the committee against states which violated their human rights. And that's what uh, uh, Mr. Teotihuacan actually used. The decision of the United Nations Human Rights Committee well, it's not binding, it actually has consequences. And it puts pressure on countries to consider climate change asylum claims. In the case, uh, in this case, Teichota claimed that the state party by deporting him violated his right to life under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights by removing him from Kiribati, uh, him back to Kiribati. He argued that the rise in sea level rise made it, uh, it uninhabitable for its the residents. While the committee eventually found that the Teotihuacan's claim, Te claim uh, had not been, deportation had not been unlawful, he, as he didn't face immediate danger to his life, it recognized that climate change represents a serious threat to the right of life and therefore decision makers need to uh, take it into account when examining challenges to deportation. The committee stated that um, it may be unlawful for, under the International Covenant on, on Civil and Political Rights for governments 
to send back people to countries where the effect of climate change exposes them to life-threatening risk. This is Article 6 of the Covenant, and where they are at risk of facing cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. This is Article 7 of uh, the Covenant. So, Olga, if I can just move you along um, yes. and to summarize, I think, some of the details of what you're saying. It's not legally binding on UN member states, but it's a very useful lobbying tool. How does it move from being a useful lobbying tool to being something that is legally binding on UN member states? I suppose, how does it become a General Assembly resolution? I'm not sure if that's a question for you or a question for Elan, or indeed, at this point, whether we shouldn't open it up for the floor. But Olga or Elan, do you have some reflections on that before I throw it open to the floor? Uh, thank you. Well. It's, while it's not legally binding, it definitely sets a global precedent. And it states that a country might be in breach of its human rights obligation if they return uh, someone to a country without due consideration uh, uh, to these uh, um, circumstances. And it's um, basically what it also means that uh, the right-based litigation on climate change continues to gain traction and it opens the door for um, future climate refugee claims down the line. It allows lawyers to actually use this precedent setting to argue in future court cases for the client. We also need to take into account that two committee members descended formally from the ruling, stating that um, uh, basically uh, deportation of Teotihuacan was uh, arbitrary manifestly erroneous or denial of justice. And that can also be used in the future for the, by the lawyers. What, another element, you, you, you pointed a very good point on the lobbying um, uh, character of this decision as well. This, on top of providing lawyers with this opportunity to, uh, to argue the case and defend uh, um, individuals in, in court and legally, what, what it also, the committee also highlighted that uh, the role of international community, that without robust national and international efforts, the, ex, uh, the effects of climate change may expose individuals to a violation of their rights under the Article 6 and under, under Article 7 and trigger the non refoulement obligation of uh, receiving states. Uh, in that case, non reformant obligation is a fundamental principle in, in international law that forbids a country receiving asylum seekers from returning them to, to a country where their life can be in danger. Right. So just to summarize, it seems what you say is if the principle of non reformant can be argued that it can be argued that climate change um, would kick in if there was a case of reform more. Um, before I throw this up the floor, just Elan, a few reflections on where we go. We heard the previous session say it wants to feed in to the policy debate. We've heard your very healthy and I think very useful scepticism, born of a very authentic compulsion to help people. But where does this combination of scepticism and the need to get things right empirically and what we've heard Olga say about this very useful lobbying tool that has suddenly become available to us, where, where does that go, do you think? Well, rather than feeding into the policy agenda, I hope that we could set the policy agenda and ensure we set it on an evidence basis. So we don't need to exaggerate to make issues of climate change prominent. We don't need to exaggerate to make issues of migration prominent. We just have to be careful about linking them. And this is where we can all be involved. So for example, RDR, we run master's programs. And next year we are starting a bachelor in humanitarianism, which Peter mentioned at the introduction. So come and join us, study with us, and don't be a follower of policy, be a creator of policy. Wow, that's a very powerful note on which to end. Ilan, it's a real pleasure to be in conversation with you and thank you very much, Olga. If I can just summarize, I think what I think Ilan is saying is let's set the policy agenda, let's not catch up and join it later, but let's do so on a sound scientific and empirical basis. So are there any members of the group who would like to react to that or to react to anything which Ilan or Olga have said in this session? Please, the floor is open. There are several questions there. Shall we go through them in order? Oh, sorry, I'm being very slow. Let me, so, um, so Mozharul Islam. So my question is to, to, to Ilan, if you don't categorize the displaced people due to climate induced disasters, how could climate justice be insured for the large numbers of climate migrants? Good question, Ilan. 
Yeah, well, I mean, first climate migrants are typical. So this is nothing new. Again, the difference is climate or climate change. Second, we should not be focusing on climate justice. We should be focusing on justice. If we focus on only one element, then we're actually going to miss all the other ones and potentially cause more problems than we solve. And the final issue is that disasters are not climate induced. Climate is merely changing weather, which is environment its hazard. Disasters are caused by vulnerabilities. If we focus on reducing vulnerabilities, we achieve justice and we prevent forced migration while supporting voluntary migration. Everything comes together. Thank you. Can I bring in Dorota? Because I don't entirely understand your answer. Dorota, are you are you with us? And if so, I give you the floor to ask your to summarize perhaps your three questions and to put them to Elan yourself. Um, or I could actually just go through them quickly. Okay, why, why don't you go through them? How will the local natural water conditions change, which will probably which will directly uh, to the agriculture and migration? And this was actually linked to another question about fresh water in Bangladesh. And remember that water is affected by the environment as well as by our use. So when there is a freshwater scarcity, when there is a drought, in most instances, it tends to be more because of our mismanagement and our overuse than necessarily varying precipitation or snowmelt. This does not stop the fact that, yes, yeah, sometimes it stops raining and things dry up and we have to be ready for that. But we have to be very cautious of attributing lack of water and changes in fresh water immediately to climate change when there's many natural variations and when much more is impacted by the amount of people, the amount of water they use per person and agriculture and other issues. So again, it's about balance. We cannot deny climate change, we are causing it and it affects rainfall and snow, but we also have to deal with our own impacts and ensure we're combining them. Uh, in terms of extreme events affecting people, well, this is disaster risk reduction. So we don't need climate change to help us implement policies to stop disasters. All we have to do is tackle vulnerabilities and we've known this for centuries. Will the protracted pandemic uh, limited climate refugees moving as well as limit climate migrations? What the pandemic has actually done is reduce migration. And it's also forced a lot of people to return to their point of origin. Making these links to potentially climate influence migration is ongoing work, and we don't necessarily have answers. But yes, these are questions we need to consider, particularly the importance of migration being having many reasons, not just COVID, not just climate, not just climate change, not just earthquakes, but many, many reasons. And so we have to factor them all in if we're trying to understand migration and support voluntary migration. Now, Ilan, we also have a question from Tushar Pradam, who says, in the discourse of climate change migration, what are the ways bottom-up approaches um, can help us help, help, help the voices of those affected, those of the most vulnerable, find expression, uh, particularly in regard to small island nations? No, absolutely. And this is actually where I'm fully limited because I am a researcher sitting in London. It's all very well for me to go out and talk to people or get them to communicate with us otherwise, but there's always a power relationship there. So this is a crux. How do we get, how do we really hear the voices of the people who are most affected and can, and can potentially help themselves or to express their needs? And a lot of it is in fact what we are doing today. I mean, the organizer of this, Bias Ahmed, has been wonderful in bringing in people from the regions to talk about the region. So it's not just me trying to be sort of a talking head. And the more that we can connect online with people in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, the more we can get them to write their own experiences in their own words, the less you hear from me, and the much better we will understand what they are truly experiencing and what they truly want. Thank you. We also have um, a question about salination in uh, water sources in Bangladesh are increasingly um, contaminated. Um, if that is the case, can those people be called climate migrants? That's from Shams at the University of Sussex. It depends on the reason for the salination. Cl human caused climate change is causing seas to rise. That is causing infiltration of fresh water. That is absolutely directly caused by climate change. Conversely, groundwater extraction is also causing the water table to lower and causing some salination. That's not climate change. At the same time, a good proportion of Bangladesh is a delta. 
is where three huge rivers meet, which are fresh water. A lot of that fresh water flow is now changing because of climate change affecting the Himalayan glaciers, but a lot of the fresh water flow is changing because people have built dams across the rivers. So again, this is where we can't say it is only climate change, but nor can we ignore climate change. We have to try and balance the factors and try and ensure that we understand why are freshwater levels changing, why uh, are the salt levels changing, and try and decouple what is climate change and what is not. Ilan, we have a very interesting question from Shah Muhammad Atikul Haq, um, who's asking about modeling beyond numbers. He says, people design and model with numbers. Um, oh, his question has disappeared. Um, he's essentially saying, should we use other factors, social, cultural factors in our debate, in our modeling around climate change or climate migrants? Absolutely. And we do so much interdisciplinary work at IRDR trying to ensure that the numbers are as accurate and as precise as possible, but that's not often possible. So that's where qualitative research, historical research, thinking about cultural perceptions, thinking about people's perspectives have to input into it. We should not throw out numbers, but nor can we entirely rely on them. And bringing together different people in different disciplines is exactly what this questioner is saying. And it is so important to cover all these methods all these data sources have a widespread understanding of what we do mean uh, by the graphs or by the models or by different data, combine them all in order to try and get as best a picture as we can without just relying on me, I mean, definitely don't do that, without just relying on interviews, without just relying on models, but really joining them and linking them. Now, an interesting question from Ugogi Ezzi, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Why is there such reluctance to locate climate change and refugees? It's sort of, it's a political question almost. Why is there this prejudice, do we call it, reluctance, do we call it, amongst policymakers, in your view, Elan? Well, I find the opposite. I find that almost all movements are actually attributed to climate change, whether or not it's legitimate, and in most cases, it's not legitimate. So why some people are nonetheless reluctant is because they don't accept the science. They think that humans are not causing climate change, which is ridiculous. And they're also anti-refugee, which is really inappropriate. Those on the side of linking everything to climate change are not looking at the science and are not looking at the multiple factors. And the questioner also says people are on the move due to climate change induced conflict, but there's no climate induced conflict that we can identify at the moment. Conflict is absolutely happening. It is devastating people. They're being forced to move when all they want to do is live their lives. And conflict is caused by people. Conflict is not caused by the environment. Now, a related question, Ilan, from Daniel Gonzalez Greco. Um, she says, thank you for being so clear, by the way. What is your opinion about why policymakers do not apply the, cautionary, the precautionary approach to address the issue and create a proper protection framework? Yeah, precautionary principle is tough because there's about 382 different definitions and about 383 different interpretations. So a lot of it then simply means, well, what are we talking about when it comes to the precautionary principle? When it's policy and decision makers, a lot of what we are seeing today, particularly in prominent governments, is that they are governing based on ideology. They are not taking scientific principles, they're not taking evidence, they're not even necessarily interested in what may be best for them. They're saying, I take my ideology and I move forward and try and justify on that basis. So if precautionary ideas, if prevention is not part of the ideology, it's not going to be there. We know that the evidence is prevention is better than cure. But if the ideology is that I want more money and everyone else wants less, then my decisions are going to be focused on that and any aspect of helping people, any aspect of precaution, any aspect of preparedness or prevention is simply not going to be within that remit. Now, Ilan, a question from Rebecca Parrish also about interdisciplinary research. She says, from your comments about the agency and dignity of affected groups, it is clear so that interdisciplinary research across science, social, sorry, social science, social science and humanities, SSH is needed. However, this is infamously hard to achieve. She says, I've heard so many times um, how SSH research is neglected in policy discussions, especially if policymakers want to count the numbers of climate migrants. What are your thoughts on these two challenges and how to tackle them? Brilliantly articulated. <laughs> how to tackle them, do it. Don't hesitate. 
this is an IRDR seminar and we've been talking about the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, but I'm actually only 50% at IRDR. My other 50% is at the UCL Institute for Global Health, which is actually where Becky Parrish sits also. And to have the creativity and vision, which the two directors of these institutes brought forward to create a position across these departments and then foolishly to hire me, this is how we do it. So rather than saying, oh, well, they're just modelers, they're wrong, they might be useful, but you know, whatever, or rather than saying, well, they're just artsy hum humanists or social sciences, no, listen, listen on their own terms, drop a lot of the vocabulary and a lot of the jargon, you know, we've heard all sorts of things, like social ecological systems and really big words and phrases like that, which don't mean a lot to me. Let's just speak in this case, English, let's just speak English to each other exchange viewpoints and ideas and come together to say, okay, I don't understand your method, but you know what, I'll use it because you're here and you're the one who can do it. It's not about trying to silo and separate, well, they're social scientists, they're humanities, they're physical scientists, they're engineers, but say we all have skills, we all have knowledge, let's sit in the virtual room, pool it and write up science which influences policy. And it's not about, well, what are you going to do? It's about what are we going to do? Because if others aren't doing it, the agenda is left for us. Now, a question that I have a certain sympathy with from an anonymous attendee. In the current policy context of rhetoric and exaggeration, is our bid for moral purism, I'm not sure that Ilan has made a bid for moral purism, brackets and belief that they will see the evidence and surely the policy will follow, actually prohibiting positive action for both migrants and in achieving justice. In other words, there's a certain frustration that in getting hung up on the categories and the numbers and the, the purism, forget moral, um, are we inhibiting action or are we ultimately going to make action more effective perhaps is a positive way to frame the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm under no illusion that policy is evidence-based. I want it to be, I, I advocate for that, I wish it were, but you're, the commentator's right, it simply does not happen. What we do see is that people have their predetermined ideas and they will use science or scientific debate to support their predetermined ideas no matter what. So if you don't want action, you'll say, oh, well, these scientists disagree on tiny points, so let's wait 20 years for more science. On the other hand, if you want action, you'll say, well, you know what? The scientists agree on 95% of it. So let's base our action on that 95%. This is a real issue, which I don't understand and how to get under. How do you create values? How do you change ideologies? These people are using whatever they want, whether it's a Facebook posting or a scientific paper to support radically different ideologies. And some of them do claim moral purism. Others say, I don't care about morals or ethics. I'm doing what I want. For me, I'm a scientist at the top research university in the UK. Therefore, I absolutely say, let's systematically go through the evidence, see what we know and we don't know, and move forward no matter what the uncertainties. Is that happening? No. We need everyone on board to support us in trying to ensure that happens without virtue, virtue signaling, without moral purism, but just saying, this is about people, this is about us. How can we best use the evidence available to act now while continuing to improve the evidence basis? Now, a great question from Laura Kaiser, um, who's taken a step back, if you like, from this, this debate and said, if we don't categorize people, how do we choose people to talk to an interview? Don't we already give them a category by filtering certain people out that we should ask questions like, are you thinking about moving? Do you see what she's saying, Elias? Like, how do you select that group that you even ask the very general question to you, are you thinking of moving? No, absolutely. And this is a fundamental limitation in this type of research. So yeah, all models are wrong. Some are useful. All interviews are biased, but some are useful. All sample selection has errors, but some are useful. So these are the questions we need. Please continue asking them. Because remember, when we write a paper, it's only 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 words. It cannot include everything. There's always limitations. There always has to be balance. As long as we're open and honest about them, we're fine. And then we can start pooling knowledge. But what you articulate is a basic, basic limitation of interviews. And by using many methods, we can overcome some of them. But no matter what, whether I do the interview or whether Laura uh, Keys or Kaiser does the interview, we can get different answers simply because of who we are. That's not necessarily bad, it, it is what it is. So we can only do our best, try and do things in different ways with different methods, 
and then bring it all together to develop as complete a picture as possible. Thank you. And can I bring in Professor Tasneen Siddiqui, who's just sent a message saying she would like to answer this question live. So, um, Professor Siddiqui, over to you. You're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Uh, no, I, I actually wanted to hear from him, uh, from Ilan, that, you know, when uh, this whole securitization of migrants, be it climate induced, be it development induced or whatever. So there is this, in, even in the climate context, we would like you to answer how to desecuritize this whole issue of migration. Yeah, the, using the word security has been highly insecure for a couple of decades now. And certainly about 10, 15 years ago, suddenly in climate change, everyone was talking about human security and migration was seen as a security issue and climate change conflict was seen as a security issue, even though right. there is no climate change cause conflict. So how do we desecuritize it? Stop using the word security. <laughs> and where does that lead? How does that broaden? How does that open? How does that widen the debate? Well, to me, it comes back to, I think, treating people as human beings, which is something which governance is not very astute at doing at the moment, because we use all these wonderful words and phrases in order to try and obscure the fact that we are dealing with human beings. The challenge, of course, is, again, I'm coming from a scientific perspective where I'm independent and I can speak my mind. But if this is a non-starter with those making the decisions, it can be retrogressive. For example, a lot of military leaders who have been educated and operate in a certain way, if the word security is not there, that doesn't concern them, they're not interested. So what a lot of people have done is framed it as security to get in the room and then try and convince them otherwise and move forward. And I fully accept that as a legitimate strategy. However, my viewpoint is that scientists should still be as honest as we can be and as independent as we can be. And by suddenly, by immediately framing it as security, we're already closing doors and causing problems. So in a sense, it is this irreconcilable viewpoint. How much do you compromise so that people listen to you and change on your behalf? And do you have to compromise too much that you actually cause more problems? And there's no solution. Sometimes I compromise, sometimes I don't. People compromise in different ways at different levels. What's so important is that people are here and asking questions and challenging us. So if I make a decision not to compromise, they can say, hang on, Elan, you're making a mistake and here's why, and maybe convince me. Or if I compromise too much, they can say, you know, you've gone too far. You need to pull back and actually stop causing these problems. It's not about me. It's about all of us checking each other, challenging each other, asking questions, because ultimately I hope we have the same goal of let's stop climate change, let's prevent disasters, let's help people. And by working together across our disciplines, backgrounds and approaches, we can hopefully join together, check each other and really end up influencing those who have the resources, the choices and the power. Ela, a question from Matilda Stevens, who says, I wonder what your thoughts are on borders. It seems a bit like the elephant in the room in all these conversations. I suppose that, Matilda, you'd see as being further complicated by COVID and the fact that some states are simply shutting their borders. Elan. Yeah, again, there's the academic and the practical response. And the academic response is, oh, well, we've had the nation state since the Treaty of Westphalia, and maybe we've gone beyond that, blah, blah, blah. That actually doesn't help people who say, no, I like my nationality, I like my country, and I want to control my borders. So in a sense, this is where I am actually willing to compromise. And while I would prefer much more of a united humanity, I also recognize the value of different cultures, of different countries, of different nationalities. So I personally do not really call for an end to national borders. I do like some of these multinational uh, approaches where they might open their borders for many instances, but still retain the right to have checks and to close them. And trying to get reach that balance of controlling international borders without inhibiting people who deserve to be able to move and to operate even for tourism, never mind for business, is a real difficulty. What definitely concerns me about exactly what you're saying, this challenge on borders, is when people say we can close them completely and just go it alone without worrying about everyone else or the consequences. Temporarily, after 9-11, temporarily during the pandemic, absolutely yes. 
temporarily to stop terrorists traveling internationally? Absolutely. But overall, I think we gain so much more by having them quite open and by letting people move for various reasons. But nonetheless, I do accept and recognize the importance of still having a country and still having immigration and passport checks so that we can catch criminals while actually facilitating the entry of those who need it and deserve it. Ilan, thank you. I'd like to start pulling some of these threads together with you before our session ends, which it will do soon. But a quick question from the floor from um, Mohammed Nazu Nadiruzaman, who says, Ilan, thank you very much for these fantastic reflections. I personally feel that climate change discourse in the global south and surely in Bangladesh has been represented by the elite perception of sufferings, which obscure practicalities of people at the edge. How can we change this, this situation? An advocacy voice, where do we find the authentic voice of the impacted communities and how do they, <clears throat> excuse me, find expression in the international discourse? By absolutely bringing <clears throat> as many voices as we can, by asking them if they do want to be represented and if so, how, and then doing that and following their instructions and, and challenging people on an evidence basis. So when people say, well, you know what, climate change has caused these wildfire disasters or climate change has caused these hurricanes, well, it's fairly easy to respond to that wildfires are actually a natural ecosystem process. Climate change is making them much worse to the point that ecosystems are suffering, but climate change does not, cannot cause a specific fire. Same with Hurricane Delta, it reached maximum category four. At landfall, it looks like it might be about three, so that's not even close to the maximum of five. And of course, hurricanes have happened for millennia. So when we hear statements, such as trying to attribute causality to climate change where it doesn't exist, just politely, respectfully challenge it on evidence, but always ensure that we don't undermine the people who are suffering most and try and give them the options and resources which they need and deserve to make their voices be heard. And that might be telling me I'm wrong. Please do so in a polite, respectful and evidence-based manner because I've changed my views so often and I continue to do so. So, Ilan, just drawing some threads together, we've heard from several questions from the floor about the need to find and articulate the authentic voice, not to take the discourse <clears throat> and narratives of the elite. We've heard Olga say that there is a new advocacy tool for UN member states, for governments, in the form of this Kiribati ruling. We've heard you make a plea for evidence-based public advocacy. Um, where does this go from here? I mean, where are the sympathetic um, governments, the sympathetic, where are the open doors and how should we lean against them? Over to you, Ilan. It's up to us to pick the venues and approaches which work for us best. Uh, by supporting each other on the assumption that we do agree at least on the fundaments, some people want to use Twitter and that's fine. Some people avoid Twitter and that's fine. I've made a very deliberate decision to be a scientist, which means teaching, research and public engagement. And I've been so privileged and fortunate that UCL and my directors have given me that opportunity. Other people don't like teaching or they don't like science. They actually want to join governments or join the private sector or the UN or the, or the public or the nonprofit sector and work from within. We need all of you. It's about all of us reveling in our diversity, recognizing there's not one size fits all. We need multiple pathways at the same time and looking at the advantages we all have together while ensuring that we overcome our limitations by supporting each other. So do what works for you. Find out what's best for you. Engage, interact in the venues which work for you. And then together we can move forward to try to ensure that we do not neglect climate change that we do not neglect forced migration, that we do not neglect voluntary migration, but that we're very cautious and careful about the links and try and develop policies which are not for one sector or one point only, but actually join disasters, climate change, migration, health, sustainability, development, and ultimately people, people as human beings. Elon, on that very positive, creative thought, I would like to end. Thank you very much for being such an inspirational uh, guest in this In Conversation. My thanks to you. My thanks to all who've contributed. And now back to you, Vice. Thank you. And thanks very much. And if anyone wants to continue engaging or has questions I didn't answer, let me know and we'll continue communicating. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And
and for moderating the session and also of course thanks to professor ilan and olga olga thanks for br bringing some international laws and issues on uh, climate migration next uh, we will go for an hour of lunch break we will be back again at 2 p.m i would request all the participants to join us we will have we will welcome Dr. Kanta Kumari from the World Bank for the keynote speech and followed by, we'll welcome Dr. Brian Jones from USA to moderate a session on climate migration in Latin America, Africa, and the Pacific Islands. Thank you everyone. Uh, let's take the break and we'll be back again at 2 p.m. just after an hour from here. Thank you. <laughs>